Today, I'm going to talk about how you can analyze uniaxial tension data when you have necking and try to extract a stress strain material model, a constitutive model, from the tension data that you have. So, to do this, I came up with an interesting strategy that is, I start with the material model that I have defined. In this case, I'm using the polyumod T and V model. It's a viscoplastic material model that can have a softening after yielding. So I start with that. I have that. I simulate, using a finite element program, a tension specimen, as you can see here, that's being pulled. And from that, I get nice necking and the neck growth. And this is something that was discussed in a previous video of mine. Now, the purpose today is to see, can I recover, can I extract the original material model by simply looking at the finite element results of this dog bone specimen as being pulled apart. And the purpose here is to say, well, this is kind of similar to an experimental test where I test something in tension, I get necking, and I perhaps have a DIC program analyzed the data. Can I extract the stress strain data in a reliable way from the DIC data? The purpose of not using DIC data here, but instead using a finite element result, is that I already know exactly what the material model is. So I can compare the results I get from a different extraction procedures to what the true material model is. So that's what I want to do here today. And let's jump right into it. You can see from the specimen here is that it's a 3D specimen. It has a certain thickness to it and it has a width here. And this was performed in Abacus standard using C3D20 elements. And um, when I run this, I, I have to pick, of course, uh, one, one element or multiple elements to study. So I'm picking one of the elements in the middle. It's element 250, it turns out to be. This is a quadratic element, so it has 3 times 3 times 3 equal to 27 integration points. So I'm just clicking on the element and I'm extracting the strain at all of these integration points as a function of time. And this is the results that I get. We see that initially all integration points are the same. Then once we start to get necking at this element location, the curves diverge, that some of the integration points start to uh, neck or uh, harden faster than other ones. So we see this variability in the strain in the specimen at that point. Um, it's interesting to note that the strain at this location here reaches a peak and it actually goes down after the peak. And why is that? It's because the stress strain curve that we're using has a, a yield stress and then a drop in the stress. So once that happens, the force in the specimen, the axial vertical force here, will also drop. Therefore, the strain will drop. So we actually have unloading. So we do monotonic tension test, we have necking, but the material at certain points inside here will unload. There will be load and unload events happening. This is strain versus time. We can also see that the strain rate is initially this slope here, and then it gets higher than that, and then it gets lower than that. So we get variable strain rate, we get unloading from a monotonic tension test. It's kind of interesting. That's also kind of useful. When you try to calibrate the material model, you want to have information about different strain rates. So perhaps this is useful. From that particular uh, simulation, I then extracted not the results at each integration point in that element. I only took the center integration point, so the centroid. Uh, location of the element. Just makes the graphs a little easier to look at. Here are the, the results. The stress at the center of that element as a function of time goes up, then it drops. Nice. That's the, the neck reaching the, the element there. And then it's flat, and then it starts to go up in this way. But it's interesting to see that the curve is, is kind of like odd. It doesn't just go monotonically up. It has some interesting variability to it. And this is a standard implicit uh, simulation. So this is real. This is not some dynamic or, or explicit effect. This is what happens at the integration point there in the center of the element. Now, if we plot the strain and stress at the center of that element, we'll see this curve. And this is really interesting to me. I'll see that the yielding occurs here. And then we have the unloading that I talked about before. We have a substantial unloading here. The stress goes back here. And then there's some kind of funkiness going on here. 
and then the stress strain curve increases with this slope up to this point and then it goes down again and then up again very interesting isn't it kind of surprising one can argue by by thinking about this at first i thought well this increase here perhaps that's related to the strain rate because once the neck goes through that center element the strain rate goes quickly up so the material model is strain rate sensitive so the stress will be higher at higher strain rates so perhaps this is related to that strain rate dependence and this drop is because once the neck has gone through the center element the strain rate will actually be very low uh, because the neck will go somewhere else so this could be because of that but it's an interesting curve a bit surprising at first that this is what happened because as we remember the actual stress strain curve of the material itself is this one on the left here. It's a nice smooth curve, but in the center, we see this response at that integration point in the finite element simulation. If we plot strain rate as a function of time from the finite element simulation, we see that initially it's constant, and then we have a negative strain rate, that's what we talked about, and then the strain rate goes very high, and then it goes almost to zero, as, as we kind of understand from understanding what's happening in this particular case. But it's interesting though, look at the magnitudes here. The initial strain rate was around here. The peak strain rate, it's almost 10 times higher. So you get a pretty substantial strain rate difference in the specimen as the neck propagates right through that element. That's kind of interesting. Another thing that's very interesting is if I look at this element here, this element 250 in my study, and I plot the Poisson's ratio. So that is the, the negative of the transverse strain divided by the axial strain. And you typically define it. I'm using true strains here, so I call it the true Poisson's ratio. Such so at 0.4, and that's because of the bulk modulus versus the shear modulus that I selected in my material model. But then look, the, the Poisson's ratio goes up a lot. It becomes this high, 0.57 or something like that. Then it drops rapidly and then it becomes like this. Very surprising at first. Kind of interesting too. Clearly there is something going on here as this neck propagates through the specimen. You can think about it, it's kind of like pushing the element in this, this necked region as it goes through. And that's why the Poisson's ratio peaks this way. And then it's okay that it's more than 0 0.5. Of course we have an inhomogeneous stress and strain state at that point. So this image is right from the peak, and you can kind of see how it's squeezing the material in, causing that kind of response. Again, a little surprising, isn't it, that it's so strong dependence on that in this particular simulation. If you look at other strain components, we already plotted the main axial component, that's LE22 here. That's the vertical strain that I apply. But if you look at the other strain components, we do have a non-zero shear component, but it's not very large. But what's even more interesting is if you look at the two transverse strains, clearly there are two transverse strains um, because it's a 3D problem, we see that they're not the same. We get what looks like an anisotropic response. And why is that? Well, the material model is isotropic, but we do get an, this anisotropic kind of response because the material itself uh, is confined. It's wider than it is through the thickness, and therefore there will be some confinement that's different in the two directions. And also because of the boundary conditions, the way it's held, we have the, the shoulders of the specimen. So you, the point here is that you can get this kind of response that is a little bit non-intuitive unless you think it through. And this is what happens. Again, indicating how really complicated the strain and stress is in the specimen during this deformation state. I'm kind of surprised by that in some sense. If you plot the stress components in this center element uh, that I have been studying. The green curve is the, the vertical st uh, stress, the main stress, and it's having the shape that we talked about. But we look at the other components, we see that they are not zero, and they can actually be pretty substantial in terms of its ratio compared to the main stress during this transition region as the neck propagates through that element. Um, so it's suggesting that the reason why we have this interesting shape and kind of odd shape to this main stress is it has to do with also the other stress components which go under undergo these particular uh, transitions from positive to negative as 
the element is being sheared and compressed and then relieved from all of that deformation. It's a complicated problem for what's really happening at that element in the center as the neck propagates right through. So the purpose of all of this was, well, what if I take my element that I'm studying, I take the center of that element, the integration point right there, and I extract the vertical stress and strain, can I use that to calibrate the material model? So without even going and doing that, I can simply apply the material model that is actually here. And I apply the strain history that I extracted from that location, and then I get the dashed line which is then compared to the actual stress that was reported by the finite element program. You see that it looks really good up to here, but then it becomes very, very different. It's a multi-axial stress state that changes the response. You can't, in this case, predict the, the, the actual stress at that point using this material model without having more information about the multi-axial nature of the deformation at that point. Pretty interesting. This difference is much larger than I initially had thought it would be. And it's kind of uh, interesting because it has influences to what we do with this kind of situation. Um, if I plot not only one integration point from that center element, I pick a few other elements. Here, here is a complete set of five different elements that I picked inside the gauge section and extracted the vertical stress as a function of the vertical strain. And you see this, initially they're all the same, but then they diverge significantly. This is not stress versus time, this is stress versus strain. So one would say if this was a DIC experiment where you measure something practically, you could have all of these different variations in stress versus strain. And there is, of course, no single material model that can predict all of this because the material model will only have a stress as a function of the history of strain assuming it's uniaxial and it's not. So you can't capture all of this. You can't accurately calibrate the material model using a single element location unless you have more information, which would be transverse multi-axial stress and strain, which is typically not done in, in material model calibrations using a, a specimen that undergoes necking. So this is interesting, isn't it? So to summarize, the stress and strain state is in uniaxial before necking and once the neck is propagated all the way through. For intermediate situations, when the neck goes through the element, it becomes much more complicated and it's not so easy to calibrate a material model at that point because of the multi-axial nature of what's going on. So how do you overcome this? This is something I will talk about in a different video, but you really can go back to the inverse finite element simulation approach. You simulate your tension specimen and you find a material model that matches the force displacement, not the local stress strain at the location. Anyway, that's all I have to say about this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can write them below.